Welcome to our gathering at Hope Church. We're honored that you're joining us today. At Hope Church, we exist to connect people to live the life of a Jesus follower in Las Vegas, the West, and the world. We hope you enjoy the service. Today, uh, I think you and I are going to witness one of the most loving and beautiful stories of the New Testament. I think what makes it so beautiful is uh, you're witnessing a person who loved God so much that they would hold nothing from him. Someone who loves God so much that they are willing to give him his last, even if it costs them. It's a love that once you see it, once you hear it, once you witness it, you have no doubt in your mind that this is complete devotion. It's a story of love on one end, but on the other end it's a story of great contrast. Because Christ is going to take this character and put it up before our eyes to go, this is what it really means to respond to me for who I am. And then the other picture he will show us is the reality that even though we should respond to him this way, this is often how we respond to him, especially when it comes to money. Now, I know I just said a curse word in church. (laughs) In fact, when I said ma, I heard the seats begin to squeak a little bit. I know this topic of money is one that makes us a little bit antsy. But I think we forget, hear me now as Christians, how often Christ talked about money. In fact, in the Bible, over 2,000 times, money and possessions are mentioned. You, 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 you didn't you did hear Rich, they didn't hear that. They didn't hear that. Over 2,000 times, Jesus taps on the issue of money and possessions. Why? Because I believe, Pastor Jeff, nothing motivates us more And nothing exposes us more than money. Yeah, I know it's going to be a little bit quiet this morning. (laughs) But um, but, 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 but hear me. um, In fact, I love what, what, what Christian leader Danny Aiken says. He says, on the topic of money, two truths are certain. The Bible has a lot to say about it, and most people don't like to hear what the Bible has to say about it. But to be fair, this topic of money, it, it, it's a tough one because it has many narratives. And especially within the Christian church, it has not always been looked at and always been handled properly. But hear me, hear me. Um, this morning, if you give me a few moments, I just want to try my best to kind of ease your heart, especially if you call Hope Church your home, um, because we have tried our best through, through God's grace to be good stewards of the resources in which God has given us, okay? So I just want to give you just some guidelines in which that we give to just to make sure as best as possible we are handling God's money with accuracy and integrity. And so I just want to give you a few things that that we do to keep us on track. The first thing is we have what is called a stewardship team. The stewardship team is, is both men and women who are members of Hope Church who give us counsel and wisdom and accountability on the areas of finance, personnel, and development, which means that every dollar we receive and every dollar we spend, this team has a look at it, okay? Secondly, uh, every year we give you all our annual budget. We give you all what we are spending. We put that before your face every year to show you that, that, that we are spending what we're saying and how we're spending it. In fact, we also provide times where you can come in and ask questions if you have concerns about how we're spending uh, what God has given us. And so we provide that every single year. We do not hide anything from you. We give you our annual budget every year for you to look at. All right? Thirdly, uh, every year we have an outside financial group, an, an independent accounting firm, to give us an audit. They audit us every year. Again. This is not us bragging, but it's us going. We're trying our best to steward God's money well. You hear me? Okay. And then last, um, we have been accredited by the Evangelical Council of Financial Accountability. This is a council that looks at churches and gives them their stamp of approval to say, we've seen your books 
and you're living in integrity. All right? So hear me. I gave you all that just to show you that we're trying our best to steward what God has given us in a way that is responsible and has integrity. Okay? So what I'm saying is continue to pray for us and we will continue to do this well. All right? Okay? Okay. 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 Y'all can talk back to me now. All right? Um, and while all that is, is great and very important, today I want to show you that when someone loves God so much, when, when, when someone's heart beats for God so much, they withhold nothing from him, even their money. Um, and today what we're going to see in this story is going to be a beautiful picture of what that really, really, really looks like. Today is a story of love, but also one of contrast, because we're going to see a great contrast between tradition and devotion, a great contrast between what is seen to be great and what is really least, and another contrast of what is comfortable versus what is actually sacrificial. Great love and yet great contrast, all right? So with that being said, um, the question is, Ricky, why should, I lean in? why should I pay attention this morning? Because you just said the term money, and I don't like to hear about how to spend my money. I think you and I have to lean in this morning because the story is going to tell us that we have to be reminded of what it means to love God. That we don't love God with clenched fists holding our possessions. But everything that we have is his. And I think we have to be reminded that the way we love God is not how we think, but he defines how we love him. And hear me, if you love God in that kind of way where every single day of your life you give everything to him, you withhold nothing back from him, then you have my permission to tune out. But if you're like me, and every day of your life you don't love God like that, you have one hand open and one hand closed. If you're like me, then you cannot afford not to listen to this message. Lean in this morning. God wants to show us how he defines loving him. And how he defines loving him is not with clenched fist, but with open palms. Amen? Amen. All right. Today we're going to be back in, in, in Mark chapter 12, verse 41 through 44. And, and Christ is going to give us just some real truths that, that are vital to our Christian life. All right? Um, and so uh, the truth is, uh, last week, Pastor Trenton pre preached an amazing message on a very hard passage of Scripture. He talked about uh, how the scribes, who were the, the, the preachers of the day, the teachers of the law, uh, uh, they had a wrong view of Jesus, of the Messiah. They thought that the Messiah was just going to be a physical descendant of King David. But, but Christ is going, but you missed it. The Messiah is just not a physical descendant of David, but he is the son of God. And Christ exposes that when you have wrong thinking about God, it affects how you live for him. Y'all, okay. If you have wrong thinking about who God is, it will affect how you live for him. Meaning that because they had a wrong view of God, they were, hip they were hypocritical and self-righteous and prideful and arrogant. And Christ goes, Hope Henderson, I'm showing you that when you don't view me rightly, this is how you will live. But then today he's going to take an unexpected character. One that you and I probably wouldn't think would make great strides for God. And he's going to put this person up to say, one of these pictures I like and the other I don't. One I applaud and the other I disdain. And the picture he puts up is a picture of a poor widow. All right? Y'all good? All right. Now, read with me. Mark chapter 12. It says this. Verse 41 says, And he sat down opposite of the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, 
has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Our first point is, Jesus sees what we give. Verse 41 says, and he sat down opposite of the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Now, Christ has just left this verbal spat with these scribes, these religious leaders. They have not been interpreting scripture correctly. He has a verbal spat with them. And now he's still in the temple. This was the place for, for the people of Israel to worship God. He's still in the temple. And he finds himself now in the court of women. Now, the temple had uh, uh, many courts, and one court was the court of women. Though it's called the court of women, both men and women could go in and out. Now, within this court, is, 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 it, it held the temple treasury. Now, fun fact, uh, the temple uh, was where the people of God brought their valuable possessions. Uh, they, they, they brought their fine linens. They, they brought what they really cared about. They paid taxes there. Uh, they also brought donations there. The temple uh, was a safe place. It was a sacred place. It was kind of like a, an, an Old Testament bank, okay? So they would come in here and they would give all their possessions, pay their taxes, and they would also give donations. Now, this all came not because it was just a, sac a, a sacred place, but this all goes back to the Old Testament, this idea of giving towards the temple. In fact, when God freed his people from, Israel, from Egypt, he, after he freed them, he then said, I'm going to initiate this idea of giving. In fact, I want to show you this in Exodus verse 25, uh, chapter 25. It's a long text, so, so take our time here. All right? You got it up here? Exodus 25. Yep, you keep going with that. The Lord said Moses. Yeah, you got that one. Yeah. Yeah. Speak to the people of Israel that they take for me a contribution from every man whose heart moves, uh, moves him. You shall receive the contribution for me. Verse 3. And this is the contribution that you shall receive from them, gold, silver, and bronze. Just keep going, verse 4. Blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twine linen, goat's hair. Keep going. Tan ram skins. Ooh, tan ram skins. Goat skins, acacia wood. Keep going. Oil for the lamps, spices for the anointing oil, and the fragrant incense. Onyx stones and stones for setting uh, for the ephod and for the breastpiece. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. This is God going, now I want you to give towards the temple. Not just giving towards the temple, but they also began to pay what is called a tithe. It was a certain percentage of what they earned or what they received. And the purpose of the tithe was simply to help other people who did not have much. In fact, and in, in we see this in Deuteronomy, it says... When you have finished paying all the tithe of your produce in the third year, which is the year of tithing, give it to the Levite and the sojourner and the fatherless and the widow so that they may eat within your towns and be filled. I'm going to set this picture up for you. They were giving to the temple, and as they were giving to the temple, the purpose of that was to benefit other people. All right? Now, as you understand that, in the, in, in the court of women, there were these uh, collection boxes. They were shaped like a trumpet. Okay? The cool part was, was it was shipped like a trumpet, so uh, when you put money in, the money made noise. Meaning, the more money you put in, the more noise it made, and the more recognition you got. The more money you put in, the more noise it made, the more recognition you got. And not only that, but they, it was shaped like a trumpet, meaning that it was easy to give, but it came down to a narrow uh, peak to the bottom, which meant that once you gave, you couldn't get it back. <laughs> it's a lot like being married to my wife, once I get that money, <laughs> I ain't getting that thing back. <laughs> uh, she ain't here, so it's all good. <laughs> but, 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 but now, Christ is now, after this verbal spat, he's tired probably. Sits down, and he's sitting right across from these trumpet-like receptacles, these collection boxes. And it says, as he sat there... He watched. Uh, this word watch in the Greek language is the word theoreo. It, it, it means to see with attention, to see with purpose. It means to be a spectator. It meant that he sat down, watched, 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 watched. Didn't say a word, just watched. 
And as he's watching, what he notices is rich people are putting in large sums of money in the collection boxes. Now, this is a great thing. I know, seriously, Christ is going, this is great. People who have been blessed financially, they're giving much. It hit me. If you've been blessed financially, we should give much. He does not, he does not at all condemn that. In fact, they're giving so much, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it sounds like a tsunami trickling through those receptacles. So many people are impressed because of what they're hearing. But funny, though people are impressed, Christ is not. Christ is not impressed because he says, yes, they're giving a lot, a lot of money. But they're not giving it because they love me. They're giving it because they have it to give. Meaning that they gave a lot because it didn't affect their bottom line. All right, y'all. Uh, they gave a lot because they gave from their surplus. It wasn't because they love God. It wasn't because they were thinking about him. They gave much money because they had it to give. It, it was no thought of him at all. Let me tell you something. Christ is always watching how we give. If you give reluctantly, if you give cheerfully, if you give angrily, he's watching. He's a spectator going, they're giving a lot of money, making a lot of noise. But it's not because they love God. They're giving it from their surplus. And as Christ is watching this scene, he catches someone who probably shouldn't fit in. A widow. A woman of shame. Um, and as Christ is watching this widow among these rich, wealthy people, he not only sees her, but he sees that there's something in her hand. And he watches as she drops this in the collection box. But unlike the wealthy people, it made no noise when she dropped it in. There was no sound to be heard. In fact, proof of this is it says that she put in two small copper coins. These are called leptons. It literally meant lightweight money. It literally meant it, it had no value. Now the contrast here that Christ is building, Mark, the gospel writer, goes, look at these wealthy people giving so much money, making so much noise. But look at this poor widow, this shameful woman. She puts in money and there's no noise. Christ says, which one do you think I will applaud? Contrast. Christ is going, I know you are um, really blown away by all the noise that they're making. It sounds like a tsunami in the collection box. But when she put in her money, it sounded like dropping a pin in a coliseum. Hearing nothing. I love this. I love this. Learn how to read your Bible in this emotional context. Ricky, what are you meaning? I'm meaning that this is just not a story on black ink on white pages. Put yourself in the story. Here's a woman. Has no husband. Is poor. Is a woman. And probably by society standards is, is, is the outcast. She's probably living in anguish and pain as we speak. Every single day of her life was probably anguish and pain. And yet, what makes this story so beautiful is she is still coming to God. Hear this with me. If anyone had the right to shake their fists at God, it was her. If anyone had the right to say, because life is not going the way I want it to go, I'm going to spiritually moonwalk away from you. It was her. But yet, I love this because yet, even though life is not going as planned, she is still coming to her God. We can learn something from this woman. 
In fact, Psalm 34, 18, David says that God is near to the brokenhearted and that God saves the crushed in spirit. If anyone had the right to say, I'm done, it was her. Hear me. What, what, what blows my mind is that she was not bitter towards God. Did you hear what I just said? How many of us, like me, when life does not go as planned, we begin to get bitter towards God? God, you stay on this side, I'm on this side. But she loves God. And, and, and this is what grips me, seriously. I said it, I said it in the back to, our, uh, to the staff. What gripped me is she loved God so much that she couldn't even keep one lepton to herself. I'm sorry if that didn't move you, but I literally shed tears in that moment. Because most of my um, human math says I'm poor, so I'll give you some and I'll keep some for myself. That's wisdom, right? Not for her. She loved God so much. And trusted God so much that she could not even keep one lepton to herself. She gave both. Let that sit in you right quick. She gave both. I can only imagine this woman probably felt embarrassed. Hearing the large sums of money being dropped into the receptacles time after time after time. Probably saying, God, I want to give more, but I can't. I'm embarrassed that I only have money that is not even really used anymore. But all she didn't know that just standing a few feet away was God himself in the flesh. I know that what she put in the collection boxes probably didn't do anything for the books for the temple. But what she put in that collection box did much in the book of life. Got to rush on here. Why does Christ sit and watch as a spectator? Why is he sitting and watching and not saying a word? Because Christ is very interested in how you and I Spend our money. It's going to be really quiet. I'm going to keep going. (laughs) Our first point was that Jesus sees what we give. Our next point is that Jesus sees why we give. All right. All right. It's really quiet. All right. Now Christ has the perfect seat, right? Across these receptacles, he's watching this whole thing goes down. He's a spectator. But now he's going to say the reason in which I'm spectating is that I'm not watching the action. I'm watching the heart. I'm not watching the sound that they keep making. I am watching their hearts. Proof of this, verse 43 says, and he called his disciples to him. I I love this. Christ throughout the Bible is constantly trying to pull his people to him. Why? He's trying to go, see what I see. Value what I value. Let me ask you a question. In your Christian walk, do you see what Christ sees? Do you value what he values? If not, we need to repent and say, God, I've strayed away. Hear me. Your life is not about you. We don't tell God how to use us. Your life is not about you. And if all you see is what you want to see, then you will never see what God sees. I'm going to keep going because y'all must be mad at me. All right, man. Um, I love this. I love this. Christ is going, Christ is going, come here, come here, come here. Look at her. She is the perfect picture of what it means to love God. Come here, come here, come here, come here. Look at her. 
she embodies love. Christ says, truly I'm saying to you, I'm putting weight on what I'm about to say. When Christ says truly, uh, he literally, he literally, he's, he's going, what I'm about to say is going to be heavy. It's like when I call my son's name. So, so if I say, hey, Ryan, uh, go get Trip. My daughter Ryan says, Trip, come here. My son won't come. You know, he's a little sister, whatever. Psh, got the way. I ain't even talking to you. But if she says, hey, Trip, Daddy said, come here. Oh, you best believe he coming. <laughs> Why? Because there's weight on my name. That was, that was, that, that, that was, out, that was just out, out the pocket. That was, whoo. That was good. That was good. Christ says, truly, he's saying, I'm putting weight on what I'm saying. He says, truly, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. I love this. This is the contrast. Up to this point, this woman has been less. No money. No husband, no job, poor, poor, poor. She's been less compared to those who are rich. But in this moment, the tables flip. And Christ goes, what's less is not her. What's less is them. Why? Because she has given out of her heart. I think you and I uh, constantly forget that Christ is more concerned with your attitude than your actions. The scribes had great action, I mean, uh, great actions. They read their Bibles. They wore prayer cloths. They, 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 they were the perfect poster child outwardly. He goes, I don't care about that. I see your heart. He goes, to you, you might be impressed by them. But to me, she gave from a heart of devotion and love. Hear me. For Jesus... The value of a gift is not the amount given, but what it costs the giver. I, I think you and I tend to forget that Christ is going, yeah, they give a lot of money, they, they made a lot of noise, but they didn't love me. She didn't have any money. Didn't make no noise. But she loved me. Feel the love of the story. And not just this. Christ is going, hey, I'm getting out heaven's balance sheet. And I'm trying to teach you what God values. God does not value your money. He values your heart. I'm going to say it this way because you know, I'm, I'm country. Uh, God don't need your money. God does not need your money. What he values is your heart. I love this. Um, real giving holds back nothing from God. No gift, no talent, no money, no time. It is giving all to him. But you know, Y'all don't believe me that this woman gave all she had, do you? You, you? you don't believe me. That's okay. That's all right. You, you're saying, Pastor Ricky, she probably has some money coming up the next day. No, no big deal. She's, she's had a rough day, but tomorrow she'll have some money in her pocket. And let me just tell you that this is not true. When it said that she gave her all, she literally gave her all. Verse 44 says, she gave everything, all she had to live on. In the Greek language, this last verse, verse 44, could be paraphrased as saying, she laid down her whole life. She put her whole life in the collection box. This is why Christ says she's the perfect picture of love. Let me tell you something. Real, real giving, real biblical giving, it's a sacrifice. When you really give, it hurts. Hear me, the Bible knows nothing of comfortable cul-de-sac giving. The cross screams, it hurt, and I gave it all. There is no 
comfortable giving in the Bible. When you have nails driven in your palms and your feet, how does that sound comfortable? Christ says, I'm applauding her. Not because she had a lot of money, because her heart was wrapped up in me. Are our hearts wrapped up in God? Hear me, I'll say it this way. Biblical generosity is the giving of oneself and all that one has completely and voluntarily to God. I'll say it again. Biblical generosity is the giving of oneself and all that one has completely and voluntarily to God. So the question is, what produces a life of generosity? Well, first of all, a heart of understanding. Ricky, what do you mean? Well, a heart that understands that I don't own anything. You, yeah, I'm going to spend a little bit more time right there. Let me just remind you, you don't own Jack. You don't. Some of us think that we own stuff. You don't own anything. Even your breath, you depend on God to give you. This idea of being self-made, that's a joke. First of all, physically, you can't make yourself. <laughs> just, just, that's just basic biology. I'll keep going. But to prove it to you, Psalm 50, verse 10 through 12. Christ, God says, for every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills, and all that moves in the field is mine. Here it is. If I were hungry, I would not tell you. Why? For the world and its fullness are mine. You don't own anything. You are simply a steward. Now, let me give you some real principles on, on how to steward things well. Since we're a steward, what is that, how does that really look like? Well, let me give you three guiding principles of stewardship. First of all, everything I have belongs to God. That's one thing. Secondly, God has entrusted some to me. There's two things. And lastly, what God entrusted to me, I am to use for him. Ah, here it is. God owns it all, gave some to me. I give it back to him. That's your job. God owns it all, gave some to me, I give back to him. Okay? The second part of living generously is a heart of gratitude. You, you know, and I'll be honest, guys, I, I struggle with this idea of entitlement. That somehow God owes me something. Like I brought something to the table to bargain with. One of the saddest things is so many Christians walk around saying, God, I demand, I demand, I demand, and you didn't do anything. But a heart of gratitude says, I realize that I shouldn't have received anything, but yet you gave it to me. And I want to just say thank you by how I live. In fact, 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, each one must give as he has decided in his heart. Not reluctantly, not sadly, like, oh, here, God, man, I really wanted those shoes, but all right. <laughs> or on a compulsion, like, man, here, here, take it, here, here, you want to keep, here, Pastor Rick, you want to keep, here, 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 take the money. That, that's, that's on a compulsion, that's mad. But he says a cheerful giver, he, he, that means that out of their heart they give. Is that us? Thank you. I pray it is us. See, generosity, a heart of generosity starts by understanding that everything belongs to God. And the audacity that God have to give some to me. And what I do with that is I give it back to him. Let me just say this. There's some of you right now. I, I, I want to ask you this question. Don't answer it out loud, but just in your heart. Have you ever financially given back to God? Have you ever actually invested in his kingdom through, not to, but through the local church? Through Hope Henderson? Have you ever actually invested in the kingdom? What's the kingdom? The kingdom is the idea that God wants to save people. Did you ever have this thought that someone invested in the kingdom for you? 
Have you ever given back to God financially? Um, maybe you're saying, Ricky, I would love to, but I don't know where to start. And, and, and you know what? Later on in the text, I'll give you some real application here, but, 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 but a great way to start is, is the tithe. It, it, hear me, in the New Testament, there is no tithing. There is no word for tithing, but, but it's the idea that Randy Alcorn says this way. It's really helpful. He says, if you can find a gateway to giving that's better than a tithe, 10%, wonderful. But if not, why not start where God started his first covenant people? It may be, 10 may be too much, maybe 1%. It's the idea of just that I realize that I want to give back to God. Now, for those of you who do give through, the, uh, through Hope Henderson, I want to say thank you, first of all. Praise God for you. But let me ask you this question. Is your giving comfortable or is it sacrificial? Is your giving comfortable? I, I just, I know it's there. I just, mm, just don't, I don't even look at it. Was it actually sacrificial? You know, all of us in here are wearing money. Just, just look around. Look at your feet. Go ahead. Look, look, no, look. Look, at, look at yourself. Look at yourself. Look at your feet. Look at your wrist. Look at your clothes. Look at your ears. Look, look, look. Just look. Did y'all actually look at yourself? You looked at me, didn't you? Look at yourself. Look at yourself. Look at yourself. <laughs> look around. Look, just check it. Check. Yeah, check, check, check. We're, 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 all, we're all wearing money. Let me say this. Let me say this and hear my heart on this. What's sobering is that some of us, will give God less than what we want to church. That is not at all to be rude or to be mean. That is to be honest. Some of us will give God less than what we want to church. Are we giving God our best? That time is moving on me. I got to go. Um, R.C. Sproul says, God does not need our money, but what he desires is our hearts. And what we do with our money reflects where our hearts truly are. Now, if you're saying, Pastor Ricky, that was cool, um, but I'm still not convinced. I, I got one last shot. Um, it's actually not what you can give God, but actually what God has given you. Verse 44, it says that she gave her whole life. You missed the beauty of that. Alex, you know where I'm going. And the one who said it. Do you not see the picture standing behind the picture? There will be another who loved God so much that he wouldn't withhold anything from him. There will be another who loved God so much. They did not give comfortably but sacrificially. There will be another who loved God so much that he put everything he had in front of him. There will be another who loved God so much that the world said, yeah, you didn't give much, but in the end, he gave everything for the world. There will be another who loved God so much that he wore the shame and guilt so that we might have life. There will be another who would give literally his life, not to a collection box, but to the cross. On the cross, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed me white as snow. On the cross, Jesus gave it all. All to him I owe. There was another who said, I love you so much, I will not keep one lepton to myself, but I will give everything for you. Second Corinthians 8 says, for you know, for you know, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became lepton poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Amen. 
All right, I got a band. Come on up here, band. I told you I had no idea how I was on clothes. Come on up here, band. Come on up here. <laughs> Listen, I, I got to go. I got to go. I got to go. I know some of you are saying, well, Pastor Ricky, I want to give, but I'm nervous. Hear me. Be like that widow. I know you may not have much, and that's okay. But trust God enough. Put whatever you have in the faithful hands of God. And watch what he does for your life, but it's not just about you. Watch what he does for his kingdom. Matthew 6, 26 says, look at the birds of the air. They do not reap, nor sow, nor gather in the barns. Yet your heavenly father feeds them. How much more important are you than they? If I feed birds who don't earn a thing, they just fly down, get their womb, and go back to their, their tree. What makes you think I'm going to provide for you? You didn't hear me. That's okay. I'm going to keep going, man. Um, <laughs> Pastor Jeff reminded me, he said, Ricky, have you ever thought about how generous God is? He's given you talent, education, money, a home, family. God has been generous to you. And hear me, hear me, our generosity is in direct response to God's generosity. Meaning, if God gave all to me, I want to give all to him. But here's the good news about it. You cannot outgive God. You cannot outgive God. Anybody thankful that God's generous? Anybody appreciative that God gives forgiveness and salvation to people. I mean, it's just a moment to respond and say, Jesus, thank you that you are not a selfish God. And would you take that unselfish heart and place it on my selfish heart and change me? So now the truth has been laid out. This sermon is not about money. It's about the hearts of his people. And the reality is, the one thing that keeps us further and further away from God is the clinch and the idol worship of money. So now let me ask you a few questions. Seriously, have you ever considered, have you ever thought of giving back to God? And if you're saying, Pastor Ricky, I, I, I would love to give to God, I just don't know where to begin. I'm glad you came. Listen, you can give right now through our app. You can scan our QR code. There's an envelope in the back of your seat right now. We have receptacles in the lobby. There are perfect opportunities to give. Hear me, God does not need your money. Let me tell you something. You don't own your money. Why? Because when you die, it stays here. I want to make sure you heard me out. You, you, you don't own your money. Because when you die, you can't take it with you. You know, I'm going to say this, and I'm going to get out the way. Um, it's important for us to make wise decisions about our life. I was told one time that when you're younger, you look like your parents, but when you're older, you look like your decisions. How have you decided to give everything to God? All right? For those of you who do give, thank you. I, we really are thankful for it. But the question still remains, is it sacrificial? Are you giving God our best? This has been, convic this has been a convicting sermon for me. Because I give. Man, God, I go, I haven't always given my best. So as we, uh, as we close service, as we begin to pray and sing, if God is dealing with you, there is all grace here. He's just saying, when you think about loving me, don't forget the poor widow. That is a perfect picture of what I am desiring for you to become. A person that withholds nothing from me. Father, thank you for our time. Worship service has been one that I just felt very thick in the room of your presence. God, I thank you for that, Father. We need more of that, man. We didn't come here to play games. We didn't come here just for a cute, a cute sermon. We came here, God, to submit to what your word says. 
So, Father, give us freedom to know that if we trust you with all we have, you will always provide for your children. But the question remains, do you love me with everything? So this is our prayer, Lord, in Christ's name.